All right. So let's talk about the second topic, which is not directly from the textbook, but I think relevant in the way these things are applied in the real world. And I've had, tried to add quite a few of these throughout the course. And this one is cyber war. So I just read those supplemental books and I thought they were valuable and they motivated me to teach this course. This course is based on a class Ming Chao started teaching at Tufts called Cybersecurity for Future Presidents. And I said, this is a good idea, you know, teaching people how to be responsible over cybersecurity for organizations and governments. That's really what we're talking about here. And so, um, all right. So I'm on Twitter, by the way. You should all be on Twitter. Twitter is the social network favored by security professionals. Um, you, you should be on there to be in contact with organizers of conferences, people who report security news, uh, people who do security research, and even criminals. They're all on Twitter. Um, you're missing out if you're not on Twitter. Of course, I don't recommend, you know, filling your feed with non-security things unless you want to, but as a business professional activity, you should be on Twitter following security professionals and people in your specialty. Um, so, cyber war. What we're in now, uh, it may not be obvious, but 10 or 15 years ago, nobody believed there was a cyber war. It was considered like a science fiction joke. But then, in 2010, Google kicked the can over. Now, there was an open secret in the information security community for at least five or seven years before 2010 that everybody knew that China was hacking everybody. Everybody, I heard the rumors, everybody, if you talk to anybody, they would all tell you, the big companies are all getting hacked by China, but nobody will publicly disclose it because they don't want to be embarrassed and have their stock price fall. But this is ridiculous, and these scary Chinese attackers are getting in, and they seem to be getting past our defenses. And at that time, there was a large belief that if you just paid for a security appliance to sit on the edge of your network, and that was your security gateway, that that would protect you. And then everything inside your firewall would be safe. So you had a trusted zone and you had a security defense barrier like a bastion host and everything inside was okay. And they said, you know, the Chinese are getting through our defenses, even though those defenses are supposed to be stopping them. And Google is the company that made it public. It had been secret before this, but China hacked Google seriously at the end of 2009. And I remember writing Christmas in 2009. Yeah. Yeah, China hacked, yeah, somebody said China hacked their, a Fortune 500 company. They've hacked everybody. They've been hacking everybody for years, but nobody admitted it until Google got angry enough and they publicly disclosed that China had hacked them. And what Google did was kind of incredible. It was called the Aurora attack on Google. China hacked in to steal Google's information about who had been contacting other people on Google's chat system so they could see who was connected to who to break up anti-government gangs. And um, Google found out, so Google found the Chinese server and they hacked them back and hacked into their server and stole all the data back. And when they did, they found 30 other companies' data on there. Everybody you'd think of, Adobe, Microsoft, everybody. And Google told everybody publicly, You've all, I, we all got hacked by China and all you guys got hacked by China too. Here's your stolen data on the Chinese system. By the way, I was upset at the time because what Google did was just as illegal as what China did. Google hacked across an international border, and I talked to a Secret Service representative that came to my class to talk about this, and she said, yeah, we told Google not to do that. You're technically breaking the law too, but in fact, nobody pressed charges, and indeed, I don't know how you press charges for a crime across international borders like that anyway, but the fact is, um, this is where you reach the scary situation here. In Inside our country, there are laws and police and courts and all that jazz. And if you break a law, there's a system. But if you go between national boundaries, there really is not much of a law. There's not much of a higher authority you all agree on. Really, it's just a matter of sort of jostling and arguing until you start a war or a trade sanction or something. You, it's not exactly clear what happens across national boundaries. But anyway, now this, this opened up the world of advanced persistent threats, which are powerful attackers because they are not just average criminals, they are enemy military organizations. So they have high degree of skill, high degree of resources, and they develop powerful attacks that punch right through all those expensive security appliances like they aren't there. And a couple of years after this, I went to a conference here, and they had the chief... Um, executives of major security companies like McAfee and such up there. And 
there were the people asking from the audience saying, look, we paid you $100,000 a year for your top-line security appliance, and Chinese just blasted right through it like it wasn't there. What's wrong with this picture? And they actually said, we promise within six months we are going to have an artificial intelligence system that can stop every attack on the wire without looking at signatures. And I looked at him and said, that is garbage. Nobody can do that. What's happening here is the technical people have nothing, and the marketing people just run ahead like a loose flywheel, just making up lies. And of course, they don't have that now. Nobody has that. Uh, the fact is, you, there is nothing that will stop an advanced resistant threat. You cannot prevent it. So you have to have layers of defense. You have to accept that your supposedly clean network has some machines that are under hostile control, and you have to have other layers to detect that and respond to it. So you no longer have this illusion of a perimeter and that everything inside the perimeter is clean and trusted. Instead, you move to the new system, which is called zero trust, where you do not trust anything completely. You have a degree of trust in everything and you test things to see whether they look suspicious all through your network. Um, not assuming that the antivirus is perfect or the firewall or any of your other defenses. So that was the story. That was the China cyber attack that attacked all these companies in America. This was called APT-1, the first advanced persistent threat. <clears throat> and, uh, oh yeah, and there's someone said China had its tea industry secret so long ago. Oh yes, and that's absolutely true. If you read books like the 100-Year uh, Marathon, one of my students told me to read, to read, of course, China's position is they went through 350 years of humiliation, being abused by other nations and having tr this uh, 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 abuse of them and racism and... So they see themselves as just getting even. So they do not see this as an evil thing they're doing. They see America as like an evil empire, hoarding these secrets, making all this money they don't deserve, and they are evening the scales. So they don't think they're doing anything wrong. But they're breaking U.S. law, and our U.S. companies would like to stop this stuff, and so they develop uh, enhanced security procedures to stop it, and that's what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The opium wars and so on. Very good point. That's why, you know, there are always two sides to everything. But the American side here and the Western side is that we'd rather not have China hacking and stealing all our stuff. And so we're trying to develop improved security teams to prevent that. So this is the Lockheed Martin kill chain. So you pick a target, you organize your group, you find tools, then you research the target to find the vulnerabilities and determine what you want to attack. Then you test to see if they have scanning, do simple little tests and see if you get caught. Then you deploy some tools. Find some way in, most commonly phishing. You send a phishing email to people and um, hope somebody in there will click on the link or run the attachment, and then you have a foothold. Let's see, a, a DerbyCon. I saw people watching the logs that constantly stopped a serious intrusion. Do most companies do that? Well, most of them do, most of the good ones. There's, there's levels of security, right? Some companies are very primitive and they don't have any defenses at all, um, but the larger companies have all got defenses and they have, most of them have Splunk. Like I saw a while ago, 99 of the Fortune 100 companies use Splunk. And Splunk is what you're describing. Splunk is a centralized server with all the logs on it and people monitoring it. If you watch The Simpsons, Homer Simpson is a security analyst. He's watching this control room with all these monitors to see if something bad happens and that's Splunk. So absolutely, that's your security operations center. There's a team of people looking at monitors, watching what's happening on the network, and when something suspicious happens, they see it right away and deal with it. And that's what you have to do since your preventive defenses don't keep all the attacks out. You have those defenses to stop the low-level attacks, and the high-level attacks you have to have detection and response inside your company. These are very good questions, as I expected. Anyway, then you get uh, some kind of toehold on them, some kind of control of some internal machine, typically a low-level workstation. Then you get a connection. Um, Splunk helps with IoT. Yes, you can, in principle, connect your IoT devices where their logs are also forwarded to Splunk. The problem is most Internet of Things devices are deployed not at companies but in people's houses where they don't have any of this monitoring. That's why some people are buying uh, security firewall devices for their home which is a pretty good idea to have a sort of a gateway between your home and the internet, which limits the traffic. Because a lot of the Internet of Things devices are very poorly designed because they're trying to make them small and cheap. Yeah, medical devices in hospitals really need them. Medical devices are a huge area of concern 
they are famously insecure because the people that designed them are typically not very knowledgeable about computer security and their primary focus is on medical issues like making it small, making it clean, making it reliable, and they forget about cybersecurity. So there's a ton of devices with like unencrypted protocols and default passwords and stuff. Um, yeah, and industrial control systems are the same. People are thinking about other design goals like making it run interrupted for years without crashing and they don't understand the needs of cybersecurity. So these are very good points. So once you have connection to one machine, then you steal more credentials to move through the network and do lateral uh, traversal to take over more and more servers in the network until you find the data you want, and then you exfiltrate it. Now, a low-level attacker, like, say, a, a political protester, will typically just want to do some damage and leave. Like, they'll want to deface your website or steal the list of people in your group to leak it on a public dump site, and that's all they want. That's a smash and grab attack. But advanced persistent attacks, the persistent part is they're a military operation to spy on you. So what they do is sneak a spy into your company and leave it there. So they do not do anything obvious. They cover their tracks, sneak the data out so you won't notice it, and then just live on your system forever, stealing the data gradually. That's what Google found. China had put agents on their systems to steal, say, all the PDFs, all the Word documents, all the Office documents, because they want to see everything you're developing. And they would encrypt it and put it in little bundles and send it off to China. And they had put agents on the machine, the rich sleeper agents, that would sleep for up to three years and then wake up and do it again. So that if you catch them, and clean your networks from your supposedly clean backups, there's a, a still a poison pill in there that will wake up later. So, you know, this is the military. When you're attacked by a military organization, they are not messing around, and they're going to use really nasty tricks to get in and stay in. That's the point. Advanced persistent threats are not messing around, and a simple low-level defense like antivirus is not going to stop them. It's going to take a serious, expensive security team to control the amount of intrusion from serious attackers like that. And that's what you're going to need if you run a company that is a significant target for an enemy military, like a Fortune 500 company or anybody running critical national infrastructure. So here's the groups. The equation group is the NSA. That's what the Kaspersky calls us. That's us. We are the most deadly, dangerous uh, company on the country on the internet just like we are in the physical world. We are dominant militarily and militarily in cyberspace too, which is why when people complain about China, one thing they say is, we're hacking you, you're hacking us. And of course that's true. We're hacking everybody a lot more than they're hacking us probably, but we have most of the goodies, so we have a target-rich environment for them. Then China has a bunch of them, different military groups. Iran, North Korea, and Russia. These are the primary threats to America. There are other ones, uh, like Vietnam and such, but these are the main groups that attack Americans that we worry about. And by the way, there's a tradition of using animals for them. Kittens for Iran, and bears for Russia, and pandas for China, and a lot of the names, and I forget what it is in, in North Korea, but we'll see. So here's the biggest cybersecurity threat. Russia is the most notable, um, their most notable attack was in messing in the election by uh, Trump asked them to hack the DNC, and that's what they did. They hacked the DNC and dumped out the emails, um, and of course, that led to Trump's first impeachment. Um, so they, they definitely have been messing with the United States elections using cyber attacks in addition to propaganda. China stole a lot of things. They hacked into Google, and then they stole a bunch of information from Lockheed Martin. Um, North Korea did the WannaCry attack, which was a ransomware attack that brought down a lot of things, including hospitals that got people killed. <coughs> and Iran um, leaked the Game of Thrones scripts. Uh, so, I mean, Iran is not, I'd say, as serious as the others. Um, one thing about the Iran is uh, they have a, there was one 17-year-old student loyal to Assad. Now, I'm mixing up the Syrian revolution. That's the Syrian cyber army, pardon, not Iran. Anyway, um, so... Here's a history of it. Stuxnet was the first cyber weapon. This was the United States and Israel attacking Iran to mess up their nuclear program with a cyber weapon that physically destroyed their infrastructure that was purifying the isotopes. And that was considered a huge change in the game because it was where cyber weapons did physical damage. See a question, did SolarWinds fire up our security department to step up their game? Well, we're gonna find out. SolarWinds was a major Russian attack. It is still underway. It was enormously effective. 
Uh, there are probably thousands of companies that are still under control of Russia because the SolarWinds attack took over your servers everywhere. Um, and we have been talking about upping our game. Um, it is a slow process to up your game. It's a very good question. Uh, and just, I think, yesterday, the Biden administration issued new specifications for uh, security for American industries handling military information, including that they have to implement zero trust that I was talking about. So we are trying to improve our game, but it is a slow process. And of course, it is a disorganized process in America where we don't have a strong government like China. We sort of issue recommendations and some companies follow them and some companies don't. Anyway, then Russian attacked Ukraine many times. Um, here's Chinese hacked into the OPM. This was probably a huge one. Some of the military types say this is probably the most significant one of all. They learned all the personal, embarrassing, security-related details of all of our on-duty military, which is insane. Um, here's Russian attacking Ukraine again. Here's WannaCry and not Petya. And of course, this has continued to the more recent attacks, like mentioned, their solar winds. Uh, the cyber war just is heating up and heating up more and more of this going back and forth. Yeah, U.S. zero trust posture was established after the colonial pipeline hacking. Yeah, it's been around for a while. It's been recommended in DOD, but they now have established it as an official policy for uh, people handling classified information. So here's a scorecard. The USA causing physical impact is the USA, and then Russia tried it a few times later. And then here is um, things that wipe machines favored by these other countries. Uh, wiping machines that just erase the entire uh, hard drive to hide your tracks. And then there's um, DDoS, just taking down servers so they're no longer available. There's been a lot of that going on. And so here's an example of the various sorts of attack. And as you can see, most everybody attacks the U.S. The U.S. attacked Iran very seriously with the uh, Stuxnet. Uh, the U.S., I think, doesn't have any really famous attacks on these other nations, but we sure get a lot of attacks from those nations. And so here's a timeline of Chinese attacks. For a while, there's just a whole series of different groups and different attacks. Titan Rain was on uh, um, Tibet. Uh, people in supporting a Tibetan cause in China, which the government didn't like, and there's many others. And this, of course, is several years old now, but they, it continues. Many, many military operations, all cyber types. And so, actually, there's only two kinds of companies in the United States. Those have been hacked by the Chinese and those that don't know they've been hacked by the Chinese because they're not messing around and they have powerful attacks, just like we do, that will blast right through anything you can buy like it wasn't there. And uh, they're using them. Aren't cyber war feats something you don't brag about? Well, sometimes you do. For example, Obama did. Um, it is a, a matter of diplomatic... Uh, policy, whether you want to talk about your cyber war feat in order to embarrass the enemy or something, or whether you'd rather keep it secret. We've done both. We've had some secret attacks and we've had some attacks that we publicly bragged about. Uh, for a while, we tried to keep Stuxnet secret and then Obama bragged about it before his re-election to say we really did something. So, you know, it's, a, it's an issue of politics, whether you want to admit it or not. And so here's some of the Russian attacks. Um, they shut down Chechen websites. We've been on DDoS attacks on Lithuanian websites and uh, spied on millions of citizens with something called Operation Red October and so on. Just many, many of these attacks are out there. And here's a bunch of Iranian attacks. And uh, this is one that caught my attention because it actually got me involved in training some security courses in Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia had an attack that tried to destroy a Aramco station and kill people, which is one of the attempts at our Stuxnet was our uh, was the United States and Israel attacking Iranian isotope separators and destroying them. And this resulted in destruction of their weapons program and it resulted in several deaths, sort of indirectly. What happened is Iran thought that their own scientists were sabotaging the equipment, so they started executing their own scientists, and then one of their scientists figured out that it was malware, which was hard for them to believe because they're air gapped systems. They're not connected to the internet at all, but our attack was so clever that it would hide on a USB stick and get carried by the USB stick onto there and then affect the machines. So when this guy figured out that it really was a cyber attack, the Israelis sent an agent with a, on a motorcycle with a limpet bomb to zip by, put a bomb in his car and kill him so he wouldn't tell them. And so there were a few people killed here and there, but the point was to avoid a real shooting war between Israel and Iran, which we appear to have avoided. So anyway, um, 
uh, the same dates so far are kind of like old. Yeah, all these, I paired this slide this slide years ago, that's all. There's a lot of recent stuff. I haven't updated this deck. But I think it makes the point. There's a ton of recent stuff. All right. And uh, that's why it's old. So this was the hack of a Saudi petrochemical attack from a Russian institute. And the point was to try to over turn off the security controls in a petrochemical plant and cause it to have physical destruction and kill people. It did not work, but it caught the attention of uh, people in Saudi and eventually led some people there to start some training classes I've been teaching there to try to improve the security in Saudi Arabia. Um, all right. And so here's some information from this book, The Shadow War. Um, the Russian... Um, Putin is very brazen about killing people in other countries, which seems like the sort of thing that you wouldn't like, but he kills people, and when he kills them, just like the cartels in Mexico, he kills them with a special way to make sure everybody knows who did it. He doesn't just shoot them, he poisons them with some weird poison that nobody else has. Um, so it's extremely obvious poisoning people with things like Russian nerve agents and stuff, just sort of to advertise that he will go into your country and kill people in your country and nobody will do anything about it, which appears to be true. And the United States doesn't seem to be able to make up their mind whether they have the guts to do anything about Russia. And, you know, Hillary Clinton actually went and took a reset button to Russia to try to forgive them for everything they'd done in the past in 2009. And then, as we know, Trump moved the Republicans to a position of close partnership with Russia to where every night on Fox News you see Tucker Carlson spouting Russian propaganda and saying that the Russians should be allowed to invade Ukraine and they're really doing everything fine, which is amazing. I, mean, I remember Ronald Reagan. The Republican Party used to be very opposed to Russia. Now they're absolutely in bed with Russia, and I don't understand how that happened. But anyway, um, we are again very divided, and like I say, right now they're, they're poised to invade Ukraine again, and it is very unclear whether the United States has the resolve to really do anything about it. Um, so uh, people that tried to tell Donald Trump anything about Russia were just shut down and fired because he was very sensitive about their role in his re-election, and so on. And Mitch McConnell also um, took the Russian side frequently. It is a very strange time in American politics when the Republicans are all pro-Russian. I didn't see that coming. Anyway, so the U.S. has, this was the main attack from the U.S., Stuxnet, the world's first digital weapon that had physical consequences. and. Um, there's good reports of it explaining how it worked. Um, I gave talks about it at the time and got it going. Um, it was a very fascinating attack. It used four zero days and attacked the Windows XP generation of Windows extremely effectively. And so it then called out to these football sites, which were the command and control servers, and put some kernel drivers to control the machine. And then, as military attacks do, it would infect a machine, and then it would check to see if you were the target. And if you were not the official target, it would not do any harm and just move on to the next machine. Because they didn't want to just take over a million machines. They wanted to specifically destroy the Iranian isotope separators. So it would look to see if it was on those machines, and if it's not, it would just move to the next machine. Which is what you do with advanced resistant attacks. If you just infect everybody, then you get caught, and you end up in the antivirus engines and everybody stops you. You have to be sneaky if you want to do these advanced attacks. You have to carefully attack your target and hide from everybody else. All right, and so uh, there's other classes taught, taught a lot in last semester related to this, like malware analysis. These are the skills you have to have in your company to protect you now. Malware analysis to analyze new malware that comes in and incident response the team that takes these warnings and figures out how to analyze your network, find out how you got infected, where the bad guys are, what they're doing, and how to kick them out, and then effectively kick them out, which is uh, sort of like the people that come in after a plane crash and go through the rubble to figure out what happened. And then cryptography is a big issue, and now, of course, cryptocurrency is a big issue. All these were last semester, and they'll be coming around again, but they're not taught this semester. All right, so I got a few cahoots about that. And that's all the lecture for today. So let's take a look at that. 1C. Um, all right. Like you said, my slides are old, but you people could certainly give presentations about some of these new attacks, and that would be awesome. Um, there's always new ones.
right, I think we only had 10 last time, so I'll give it a few more seconds, but this might be all we get. <clears throat> So who hacked Google? Okay, good. China, of course. Okay, which part, which of these would you not do if you were an APT? Yeah, you wouldn't deface the website. That's an amateur's move just to get publicity. And APTs want the opposite of publicity. They want to hide and keep stealing data. Where's the equation group? That's us, the USA. All right. All right. Who runs Fancy Bear? That's Russia. All the ones named Bear are Russia. And Fancy Bear is one of the big ones, very active. In fact, I think it was Fancy Bear that did the uh, the solar winds attack. Might have been Cozy Bear, but I think it was Fancy Bear. Anyway. <clears throat> All right, who leaked the Game of Thrones scripts? They're sort of lunatic actors doing crazy things like this. That's, oh, that was Iran. I thought it was North Korea, but I guess it was Iran. Okay. wonder if that's right. Let me go back to the slides. I'm troubled by this one. I thought that was North Korea. I didn't think Iran would do a thing like that, but maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. That was back here. Oh, it was Iran. Okay, good. All right. Confuses me. I expected that sort of madness from North Korea, but Iran did it. Okay. That's right. Iran also did the um, the DDoS attack against all the banks to punish us for a movie that insulted Mohammed. Uh, the al Qassam Cyber Army. Yeah, so they have a lot of uh, religious motivations. North Korea got all upset about that movie uh, from Seth Rogen making fun of North Korea and hacked Sony for that. It was a similar kind of theatrical act to the interview. That's what I was confusing it with. In my opinion, both of those are pretty silly things to do an attack about. It just shows that they have different priorities than me. I'm sort of an American. I think the uh, important things are things like big money and military, not like offending a religion or something. But anyway, all right. So who first destroyed hardware with a cyber attack? <clears throat> That was the USA. We destroyed Iranian hardware to stop a war over their nuclear program. You know, that seems to me like a very clear, legitimate military exercise. Um, and it seems to me like leaking the Game of Thrones script is kind of a frivolous waste of time, but it shows how my priorities are different than theirs. All right, so who tried to kill the Saudis?
could have been Russia, but I think it was in fact Iran. Oh, I guess it was actually Russia that did. Okay, Iran would be a likely suspect, but apparently that particular one was from the Russians. All right. So, all right, that's a two-time winner. And another two-time winner. All right, and Hadik. All right, so I've recorded the winners. Let me stop that video.